Solar cells or photovoltaics are the cheapest form of large-scale renewable energy. And over the last 15 years or so, their costs have plummeted 90%. Their module efficiency has increased 15 to an average of 21.4%. So it's little wonder that last year they accounted for three quarters of new renewable energy capacity additions. But despite this progress, many believe we are reaching the theoretical limit of efficiency for silicon PV. But fortunately, there are a bunch of very clever people pushing that barrier ever forward, all thanks to a material called perovskite. So we've come to Oxford to find out more about this mysterious solar soaking material and find out when we can all get a bit of it on our roofs. Welcome to the Everything Electric Show. So the first commercial silicon solar cell deployed back in 1954 was around 6% efficient. And today, the most efficient commercial practical silicon cells are 25%. The bulk of those efficiency increases actually occurred 20 or more years ago. In the last few years, they have been incremental efficiency improvements because we're reaching what's known as the theoretical maximum for that material. So as you approach it, you know, you're coming up to the top, the limit, uh, the rate of progress slows, and that's what's happened. So the rate of, of progress is slowed to, it's almost imperceptible now. We're at the commercial and practical efficiency limit for silicon. We've come to Oxford PV, a spin out of Oxford University, and we've come specifically to their R&D lab, which is why I'm wearing this very fashionable piece of PPE. Now, they also have a manufacturing facility a little outside of Berlin, where they have 100 megawatts of capacity each year. Now, earlier this year, Oxford PV reached a staggering 26.9% module efficiency, which is absolutely huge. Now, when we talk about efficiency in the context of solar panels, we're talking about how much sunlight is converted into electricity. Now sunlight is made up of electromagnetic radiation. These are waves that travel through space carrying energy. And sunlight is made up of visible light, infrared that we feel as heat, and UV. Of course some of that is absorbed by the ozone layer, but some of that does make its way to the Earth's surface. Now the shorter the wavelength, the more energy contained within those waves. So when we talk about increasing the efficiency of solar panels, we mean increasing the number of different wavelengths that can be absorbed, and particularly those ones at shorter wavelengths. If silicon was reaching this brick wall, effectively, limited by physics, so incontrovertible, not changeable, what could you do? Well, you could replace silicon with another material, but you might only gain one or two percent more in efficiency. So you could replace the silicon with perovskite, for example, but you'd only gain, theoretically, one or two percent. That's not enough. But if you combine two different solar cell materials, each of which is best at absorbing a different part of that solar spectrum, and as you know, the sun's spectrum ranges all the way from the infrared to the UV, uh, we can pick materials that are both on the short wavelength side, so the blue side, and the longer wavelength side, for example, the red side, like silicon. So we decide to combine a perovskite solar cell with a silicon solar cell together in a concept called a multi-junction solar cell. The perovskite is designed to absorb in that blue part of the spectrum where there's actually more energy. And the energy it can't use, it passes through the silicon, which converts the rest of the photons that the silicon can use and effectively raises the efficiency potential, the theoretical efficiency potential of that device. So silicon is limited at the maximum, theoretical, to 29%. And the closest people have ever gotten is just under 27. And that's probably it. And in manufacturing, 25. If you combine these two solar cells together, that 29% number changes to 43%. That's not an incremental improvement, that's a step change. And that's the kind of change that can be transformative for deploying, you know, PV at much larger scale, and the world needs as much PV as we can deploy. So we're currently in the room where they synthesize the perovskite material. Now to understand why perovskite is such a compelling material, we need to understand what, make, what are the qualities that make a good solar absorbing material. 
And there are a few key ingredients. Number one, it needs to have a high absorptivity so that it can absorb photons without a requirement for a huge thickness of material. Number two, it needs to be able to create a charge from those photons and then be able to move that charge very, very effectively without reabsorption, recombinations or losses. Now, semiconductors do that pretty well, and so too can perovskites, but they also have the added benefit of having a high tolerance to impurities and defects, which also means that the manufacturing of them is that much more straightforward and that much cheaper. Now here, this represents our perovskite material, and inside that crystalline structure are around 18 different atoms. There are metals, so principally lead from a weight uh, point of view, halogens, so chlorine, bromine, iodine, and they are all super abundant. In fact, bromine even comes from seaweed. So what the team can do here is really tune this structure to maximize the properties that you're getting from all of those different atoms sitting within that crystalline structure. And doing that, they can tune the durability, they can tune the band gap, and of course, the color sensitivity. So, so let me just give you a very simple way to think about efficiency in what solar cells do. The sun beams 470 exajoules of energy onto the planet's surface every 88 minutes. That's enough energy to power the entire planet for a year. That's a lot of power, okay? And the sun's really good. It doesn't raise its price hasn't had a blackout, <laughs> and it's got four and a half billion years to run. So there's not, not much to worry about it as an energy source. But if you break it down to how much energy reaches the surface of the Earth in a more tractable area, let's talk about a square meter. So 1,000 watts of energy reach the Earth's surface in a square meter roughly at noon every day the sun is out uh, on the equator. And so a solar cell's job is to convert that 1,000 watts into electrical energy. So if a solar cell is 25% efficient, it's a simple calculation. You get 250 watts worth of electrical energy out of that 1,000 watts of solar power. So imagine a solar cell that was 30%, which is, of course, the kinds of things we're talking about, 300 watts, 35%, 350 watts. If your roof has enough space to fill with solar panels that could produce 10,000 watts, 10 kilowatts. Imagine a solar cell that was 50% more efficient, 15,000 watts. And unfortunately, the demand for electricity is going up, not down. And that's putting a greater burden on the decarbonization challenge. Oxford PV have been developing this technology for quite some time, 14 years, in fact. And whilst I definitely don't mean to be facetious, why does it take quite so long? Has it been contingent on other breakthroughs in order to achieve their very milestones? Is it scalable? And even if greater efficiency means more power generation in a smaller amount of space, will it be cost competitive? You mentioned a few other materials that could be solar absorbers, and you've gone with perovskite. A, why? And B, why has it taken so long? A solar cell has to have three essential characteristics efficiency, reliability and durability, and low cost or manufacturing capability. And other materials that have been tried often meet the efficiency characteristics. So cadmium telluride is another material that meets the efficiency characteristics and reliability. Uh, and in fact, in this case, the costs are pretty good, but it's not broadly available from a material standpoint. There's not enough in the raw materials to build the kind of PV to solve the world's problem. There's enough silicon, by the way, but there's not enough of uh, the cadmium telluride materials, and that's true for almost any of the alternative solar cell materials. Perovskite's not like that. Perovskite is formulated, so even though the named rock is a mineral, it's not mined. We don't mine perovskite rocks. We actually synthesize it from raw chemicals that are abundant and very easy to obtain, mix together and create, and are sufficiently abundant and not rare that they're inexpensive, and we combine those into the perovskite material. This machine here is testing the solar cells, and what it can do is take lots of different samples of the cells and put them underneath sunlight, or simulated sunlight. And that sunlight is equivalent in power to roughly what it would be at 12 p.m. hitting the Earth's surface. You're in the process of scaling up manufacturing mm -hmm. operations at your site in Germany. 
And I hear there's a pretty exciting milestone on the horizon. When can customers actually get this on their roofs? Right. We are about to ship our first commercial saleable product to a very large launch customer in the utility market. A customer that will be deploying our panels into a field with other panels in a grid connected installation uh, shortly. Regrettably, the first customers are large customers. So the availability for residential or rooftop or commercial building customers will probably be one or two years beyond. And we have to sort of fill the appetite of these launch customers who to a certain extent are also going to be demonstrating that these panels work. So here's another machine that is testing the efficiency of the solar panels. But maybe more interestingly is that over there is a load of machinery that you are not allowed to see. It is totally confidential. And all of those machineries are creating the thin film and putting that thin film on top of the substrate. Now it's important to remember that this is the R&D facility. That's why there are lots of different machines. They've been trialing loads and loads of different techniques. So perovskite solar cells obviously have a greater efficiency compared to their silicon only counterparts. Correct. Does that mean that they have an increase in cost as well? Absolutely not. I mean, silicon is an inexpensive solar cell because it's had 70 plus years of development in manufacturing perfection. But we'd like it to be even cheaper. And the best way to do that is raising the efficiency, but doing so without impacting the cost of the energy that's produced. So the perovskite solar cell by itself is less costly to produce than silicon. The two together are more costly because you've got two solar cells, silicon plus perovskite that you're making. But the fact that it's a little more costly to produce is not relevant because the energy that's generated is lower cost. And the correct metric is, are you generating electricity at a lower cost than the existing technology? And not only is that a true case, it will continue to decline as the efficiency improves. So this is an electron microscope and it's a really, really powerful imaging technique. And essentially these electrons scan the surface of the material and then the computers can pick up the signals to build this image of the surface of the material. And actually what you can see on screen about that distance is a micron, so a thousandth of a millimeter. So they can look at things on a really, really tiny, tiny scale. So by understanding the images and by understanding the energy signals within these materials, they can build up a very clear view of the properties of these cells. So you've reached a, an efficiency of 29.5%. The new potential theoretical limit is 43%. Right. What does that journey look like to get to that new limit? Well, it's, first of all, it's a great journey because it means we're at the beginning of the journey. So we're not bumping against the brick wall. We actually can look up and see a long horizon. And if you see the rate of progress that the perovskite people, have, the workers in perovskite have made, they did in 10 years what silicon took 60 years to achieve. So I could imagine a few more years, we will definitely be hitting much more efficient targets. The best people in the world, the most efficient solar cells built with this technology are 34%. So already, they've gone beyond what we've demonstrated. Of course, they're building small devices, and we're building this, commercial-sized silicon solar cells. So we're mostly interested in records and performance at deployable scale, but it still represents, for the perspective of the technology, the potential for perovskite multi-junction technology. These little cells are made here in Oxford and those perovskite combinations are sent to Germany where they are scaled into these PVs which are their commercial scale. And these happen to be the most efficient PVs commercially available. And by the time this episode is aired, the very first ones will have been delivered to customers. But what is so extraordinary here is that innovation on the atomic scale can lead to step change of an astronomical scale. And that is truly remarkable. Let us know what you think in the comments. Please do like and subscribe. And if you have been, thank you for watching.